right. So today we'll be discussing mechanics with space applications. And last week there wasn't an official meeting due to technological reasons. But today we'll start. And first we have a five minutes video. And let's play this. Make sure the sound is on. All right, so let's check it out. Between 1968 and 1972, America launched nine human missions to the moon, six of which successfully touched down, allowing 12 men to walk on the lunar surface. NASA's next chapter of lunar exploration, called Artemis, has the task of not just going to the moon to create a long-term human presence on and around it, but also to prepare for ever more complex human missions to Mars. In short, everything we must be able to do here, we must first do here. So, what will an Artemis mission look like? Everything is designed and tested with our most important element in mind, the astronauts. This is their deep space, human-rated spacecraft called Orion, built in three parts. The crew module, where up to four astronauts will live and work throughout the flight. The service module, with life support systems for the crew and its own engine and fuel reserves. And a launch abort system, with engines capable of pulling the crew module to safety during launch should anything go wrong. To accomplish the task of launching our crew in heavy payloads, NASA is building the Space Launch System, comprising of a cargo hold, an exploration upper stage, a massive core stage, and two extended solid rocket boosters. Altogether, this is the world's most powerful rocket, and it exceeds the legendary Saturn V of the Apollo era in numerous ways. Sitting on the launch pad, the entire rocket, fully fueled, weighs just over 6 million pounds, 5.2 million of which is just the fuel. Once ignited, there is no stopping what comes next. All four RS-25 engines and the two solid rocket boosters come to life, thundering our crew upwards. Two minutes after ignition, the solid rocket boosters are spent and released. Eight minutes after launch, the core stage is depleted and separated. The upper stage fires briefly, placing Orion into a parking orbit around the Earth. Here, the crew reconfigure the spacecraft and check systems to confirm everything is ready for deep space travel. With a go from mission control, the crew reignite the exploration upper stage engines to leave Earth entirely. The exact timing of this maneuver is critical to reach a speed that can escape Earth's gravitational pull, but also put Orion on a course that will intersect the moon days later. Once this burn is complete, the upper stage of the SLS is jettisoned and the crew aboard Orion coast for several days toward all that awaits them at the moon. Approaching the moon, we see the fundamental differences between Artemis and Apollo. Instead of requiring Orion to serve as an expendable lunar command module or to carry a constrained lunar lander, the Artemis missions will take advantage of a different approach, pre-staging. Everything needed for lunar missions will be positioned in advance by commercial and international partners. This includes rovers, science experiments, and human-rated systems on the surface. But it also includes a dedicated lunar station in orbit around the moon called Gateway. Here at this station, we can pre-stage a robust lunar lander and establish a strong communications relay. Designed with open standards, the Gateway can be expanded as new missions and partnerships develop, allowing multiple human missions on the moon at the same time and enabling ongoing science to be conducted even between human missions. The Gateway is also capable of adjusting its orbit to allow access to every part of the moon, something the Apollo missions could not do. But the real key in this approach is placing Gateway in a unique halo orbit to perfect the maneuvers needed for Mars missions. And with the growing list of commercial and international opportunities, Gateway is the ideal hub between Earth and all that lies beyond. Returning to our crew as they approach Gateway, the Orion must match the elliptical orbit of the station in order to successfully dock. Once on board, pre-selected crew members transfer to the lunar lander, while those assigned to Gateway remain on station. The lunar lander system itself is built for three unique steps. Descending from the halo orbit of Gateway down to a low lunar orbit, descending from low lunar orbit to the surface, and once the lunar mission is complete, launching from the surface of the moon and ascending all the way back to the orbiting Gateway. Once back aboard the Orion spacecraft and undocked from Gateway, the crew fire their engine once to break out of the halo orbit, 
and once again to sling the spacecraft around the moon, placing it on a multi-day trajectory back towards Earth. As they near the end of this journey, the service module is released, and the crew module is oriented heat shield first. Entering Earth's atmosphere at 25,000 miles per hour, the friction of air slows Orion considerably, while also subjecting it to temperatures of 5,000 degrees. With the Orion now at just 300 miles per hour, a series of parachutes uniquely tested and produced for this moment deploy, decelerating the craft to just 20 miles per hour for splashdown. With each successful mission, Artemis ushers in the next wave of men and women to explore our moon and prove that together we are ready to go beyond. So that was a very exciting video about NASA's newest plan, the Artemis mission of returning to moon. So yeah, you can search it up and they already have a crew. And that video is from one year ago. So there are a lot more exciting news uh, coming in the future about this mission from NASA. And so today we're going to talk about sending people to space and some physics relating to it. So first, what is space? So compared to Earth, um, these are some layers of Earth um, on the road to reach space. So your spacecraft had to cross these boundaries. And space is very arbitrary, but uh, one definition is the Kármán line. It is roughly 100 kilometers above sea level. But as you see, um, that's above right here. There are still um, two layers above it of atmosphere. So uh, some, some related definition is potential energy of space. And it's a negative integral of uh, work and uh, distant change of distance. So we won't discuss that in detail as um, that's happening in physics class. And we're just going to see some cool um, engines here. And some related concept is energy efficiency. So uh, we saw in the video that there are uh, several engines and they are all burning at a very extreme com um, combustion and compression ratio. And that makes it very efficient if you create these uh, extreme conditions. Uh, so for example, here we have two efficiency chart of light bulbs. So efficiency is basically the output versus the energy input. And so output is the work that it's actually doing. And you see LED is much more efficient. Uh, not much energy goes to waste compared to the traditional filaments light bulb. And there's also orbital mechanics. We saw in the video, there's a ellipse uh, orbit of the moon landing station above the moon. And that's usually the case in reality. So we saw that what's matter about these orbits is how far they are away. Um, and you have to reach the certain speed. And also if you wanna enter the same orbit is related to this distance R and not really about how massive your object is. So next we have Rohan. Rohan prepared a great video about continuous mass transfer for us since he couldn't be here today. So let's see. Hello everyone. So today I'm unable to attend physics club due to my uh, individual sophomore student meeting with my counselor. So uh, I made this resource for you guys to follow along. Today we're discussing continuous mass transfer and our lesson of mechanics with space applications. So um, what is CMT? It's where mass is being ejected from a source, right? So you can see on the right, you have this rocket which is ejecting fuel. And so that's what causes the force of thrust. That creates force of thrust which counteracts the force of gravity or force of weight. Right? Two of the other forces in flight are lift and drag, which are negligible. Uh, we will talk a little bit about them later. 
Now our system is going to be our rocket and fuel, right? So we'll do a mathematical analysis of some of these key ideas using our rocket fuel system. So here's some key ideas. At time t, here's the rocket. Uh, by definition of momentum, we have that it's equal to mass times velocity. Right? So here you have momentum at time t is mass of rocket times the velocity of rocket at time t. At time t plus delta t, you have the momentum of the rocket again, which is um, mass times velocity at time t plus delta t. But you also have the fuel, right? Because you have the system of rocket and fuel. So from the fuel, you have this contribution of delta m sub f, the mass of the fuel, times uh, the velocity of the fuel over here. Right? And so uh, to, create the momentum of to create the momentum expression, we have to add these two terms, right? And so this is exactly what we do over here. See, here's the rocket term. Rocket. There's the fuel term. One common misconception is that this fuel term is acting downwards, right? Uh, actually, in the ground reference frame, it's acting upwards, right? In the reference frame, the rocket, it's going downward, right? So relative to the rocket, it's going away from the rocket, right? But in the ground reference frame, it's actually moving upwards. So um, let's elaborate on that. We have this velocity u, which is the velocity of the fuel relative to the rocket. Remember that, because it's important to the derivation, right? So it's the velocity of the fuel in the reference frame of the rocket. So let's look at that. This is um, the rocket reference frame. This is the rocket reference frame, right? And the V fuel over here is actually in the ground reference frame, right? How do we relate these two quantities? Well, you have to add in the velocity of the rocket at time t plus delta t, right? So it's a great example of this. Let's say, for example, I'm running forward at five meter per second. And then I throw the ball behind me at two meter per second, right? Well, relative to me, in my reference frame, the ball is moving two meter per second, right? Away from me, backward, right? But um, relative to the ground reference frame, the ball is actually moving five minus two or three meters per second forward, right? In the ground reference frame. So this is exactly the same concept over here, right? Where you have the addition of velocities between different reference frames, right? And so that, that will likely the idea that the fuel is actually moving upward because you're adding this contribution here. Uh, note that this equation is not a signed equation, right? So U is actually a negative term if you create a coordinate system where J hat is upwards, right? And u becomes negative term, which we'll cover later, right? But as of now, it's just vectors. So we're just adding the vectors to show the addition of velocities. So keep in mind our momentum expression from before. We're going to make some simplifications. So this is shorthand right here. m sub r of t is m sub r. And then here you have m sub r of t plus delta t. You can just express that as m sub r of t plus delta m sub r, right? It's just a change in the mass of the rocket plus the mass of the rocket, right? And so again, this is unsigned stuff right now. Uh, and so um, after that, uh, so you see the shorthand from here to here. And then after that, we have that delta m sub f is equal to negative delta m sub r. This is just saying that um, the rocket is just losing the fuel, right? So the fuel is uh, exiting from the rocket, right? So um, if the, the rocket is like losing mass, and then like their fuel is, you're gaining some fuel mass, right? If you consider the rocket and the fuel, right? So this is just that. It's pretty uh, obvious once you think about it, right? So this is our original momentum expression. And now we have this new momentum expression. Where did this come from? Well, you see this m sub r plus delta m sub r term over here. That came from this m sub r t plus delta t and this simplification over here, right? Then you have this delta m sub f term, right? Which we use this simplification over here and you get negative delta m sub r over here, right? And whereas this is just your v sub fuel, right? We're covering it back here, your v sub fuel over here. Substitute that in here you get that. So I'm just putting the pieces together, right? Here's our momentum at time t plus delta t. Now, why did we compute this? Momentum at t plus delta t and momentum at t. Why did we compute that? Because of this right here, right? You have your momentum principle. Force external is the derivative of momentum with respect to time. This is actually a formulation of Newton's second law, kind of. And so uh, using some calculus, right? So this is with calculus limit definition of the derivative, which we're applying over here. And um, so I'll assume that you know that. If not, Google it. Um, and so we substitute in the quantities, right, of our momentum that we calculated, t plus delta t and momentum at time t. We substitute them in, and then we have this ca cancellation, right? If you look carefully, you have uh, that this term over here cancels out, right? It's your m sub r 
times this, your delta m sub r times v sub r of t plus delta t, right? That term is canceling out if you look really carefully on those parts of the expression, right? And then you have this, over here, you have this m sub r times v sub r of t contribution, right? This negative, you subtract that there, right? And so we'll group terms. This is like a delta v sub r term over here, right? So you have m sub r times this kind of delta v sub r you can see over here over the delta t. And then we also borrow this term over here and move it like there, right? Uh, next step. So you have this delta v sub r term over delta t. We take limit as delta t goes to zero. You have calculus here. It becomes the derivative of the velocity of the rocket with respect to time. And then over here, you have your delta m sub r over delta t term limit as delta t goes to zero. This becomes your derivative of the mass of the rocket with respect to time, right? And so, and this is, this is your force external, by the way. I didn't write it uh, so many times. I started adding it over here. Um, next, we're just going to transfer this term over here to the left-hand side. We're going to add it to both sides. This is on the left-hand side. Now, um, let's keep track of what we've been doing here. This is actually the thrust term right here, right? This is because that rocket is ejecting fuel. You get this thrust term over here. Very key concept. And force external, you can put in external forces like gravity. But you can also add in uh, forms like uh, forces like drag and lift afterwards, which can factor into these um, forces external. But those are a bit negligible. For now, we're working on gravity. I guess we've, we can focus on the gravity term. And this is just mass times acceleration, Newton's second law uh, extension of that. So let's go to over here now. We have um, our equation that we were working with before. This is the same as what we had back down there, right? And um, so the, the next step over here is you consider the system as ju just being the rocket, right? And so um, what we do here is we make simplifications, right? We talked about how this is the force of thrust over here and how the force of thrust is just negative uh, derivative of the mass of the fluid with respect to time uh, times the u, u over here, which you remember what the definition of u is, right? U is the velocity of the fuel in the rocket reference frame, right? Over here, by the way, sorry. I was, I was confused for a second there. This is the negative sign, right? So remember how we were talking about m sub r equals uh, the, the negative delta m sub f, right? Or m, delta m sub f is equal to negative delta m sub r. This is just that right here. You can see over there. Um, it's a bit uh, hard to see sometimes. In mr over here, you have the mf over here. So um, that was just a conversion from this step that we made, right? Um, it's just that, basically. Yeah, so um, this is just the force of thrust, right? That we identified in the expression that we mentioned before. And this is equal to the negative derivative of the mass of the fuel with respect to time times u. And so this, know what we did over here, like where did the negative go, right? What we did was we turned this vector into a scalar, right? So this is where, sorry about that, I have low battery guys. Um, so u over here, the vector is equal to negative u times j hat, right? Because it's the it's a negative quantity actually. If you take up to the positive direction, it becomes negative quantity because it's the velocity of fuel in the rocket reference frame. Then you have gravity, of course, acting downward, which is our force external that we're considering. Next, we can put all these together and get this rocket equation. Um, this is uh, the, the 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 alpha stage of rocket equation. If we do a few more changes, and then we'll finish. But this is the basic rocket equation with our gravity term and our thrust term, right? Afterwards, we have to derive it for a specific, for a specific case. Let's look at a specific, uh, let's look at a visualization. Sorry, guys. We have um, our momentum at time t, right? It's just the mass times the velocity. And then um, some time dt passes, right? t plus dt, infinitesimal time. And you get this dm contribution and this dv contribution. So this area of rectangle here. This is MDV, this is VDM. Let's add it in. DP, which is our infinitesimal momentum, infinitesimal momentum is equal to MDV plus VDM. We'll divide out DT on both sides. There you go. And so you get that your force, remember the momentum principle, force momentum principle, is equal to um, this M, this, this is correlates to this, and then this is just V is minus U, right? So you get M sub, M mass of rocket times derivative of the velocity of rocket with respect to time, minus derivative of mass of rocket with respect to time, times the um, u, remember our quantity u from before? And so um, that is just applying this formula over here, right? And so this is a cool visualization. This is just additional speculation on what we had before. Maybe like a shortcut can help you remember the formula. 
That was a very cool idea. Right, um, let's finish up now. We had um, some of our terms from before, what we were working with from before. Next, what we're gonna do is we're going to um, divide out dt, divide out, sorry, multiply. We're gonna multiply through by dt. Sorry about that, guys. We're gonna multiply through by dt on the next step and then divide out by m sub r. So this is multiplying here. Here we're dividing out the m sub r, right? And then we can integrate on both sides from the initial to final. So first on the left, far left, we integrate um, from initial time to final time, you get this, right? Using some basic calculus. Next, you want to integrate um, the d m sub r over m sub r, right? From the initial mass to the final mass, you get this. Uh, where did that come from? You know calculus, you have really cool idea that the integral of one over x dx is the natural log of the absolute value of x, for example, right? And so from there, you just evaluate it at the initial mass and the final mass, right? If you do it with the mass instead. And u is like a constant here now, right? All right, and then you just integrate from the initial velocity to final velocity to get that. Next, we're going to impose some initial conditions at time t is equal to zero, the, the time initial. You have that your total mass is just the mass of the rocket plus the mass of the fuel in our rocket, if we're just considering the rocket to be the system, right? And then at our time final, we have that the mass final is just the dry mass of the rocket, right? The mr comma d right there is just the dry mass of the rocket, right? And then, so here you can have your initial velocity and final velocity as well. Right, we're just saying that the rocket starts from rest. Rocket starts from rest over here. Anyways, we make the simplification uh, negative g t sub f plus u natural log. So that this equation right here is just simplified from the one you see above. This is like the final rocket equation, right? And this the, the, this is the the key rocket equation right here. This is uh, what we were aiming for. So this key result. This you want to minimize this term right here. So minimize. Want to minimize this term right here. Um, and that's by making the shortest burn time, right? You want to drop some f, so that this negative gt sub f term gets smaller and smaller, right? So that's why you want a very short burn time, so that you can have the largest velocity um, to get into orbit uh, when all your fuel is burned. So, uh, next we'll this question of how much does it cost to send a person to space? Um, just place your bet, uh, think about this question, maybe do some research, uh, or just, just think very deeply using the rocket equation, as how much can it cost to send a person to space? Like maybe like make an estimate or something, right? You can have like different rockets, like like Falcon and, and SpaceX, and then uh, the, the different different rockets, right? You can use some research on that. And so next you have the drag forces, which is just any friction force in like a fluid. It's like air can be a fluid, for example, or just like a liquid, for example, right? So this is literally just any force that's resisting motion in a fluid. So that can be like a viscous force. It can be like a air resistance, right? It's generally defined as one half rho v squared plus drag coefficient times cross sectional area. Um, for example, the cross sectional area part makes sense, right? If you have like really high cross sectional area, then um, you have more air resistance, right? And then you have like smaller cross sectional area means you have very low air resistance. So that's a pretty cool idea. So you can think about like running, for example, you can think about like your track runner trying to minimize his uh, area, his or her air resistance, right? By leaning forward, you have your track runner doing that trying to improve the run times, of course. And then you have your Reynolds, Reynolds number right here, which um, basically tells you about laminar and turbulent fluid. We'll cover more about it next time. Um, but it's basically defined to be the density times the flow speed times the characteristic linear dimensions. This could be like a diameter. Like for example, for the tubing of a pump, you could have diameter in many applications. Uh, you have, uh, it's generally called characteristic linear dimension, depending on your application, right? And so you have Reynolds number, which is your density times your flow speed times your characteristic linear dimension divided by your dynamic viscosity of the fluid. And so you have this equation right here. And then, so if you have low Reynolds number, that is laminar. If you have high Reynolds number, then that is turbulent. And so your Reynolds critical, you can say, is like a critical Reynolds number would be 2000, right? Anything below 2000 is laminar. Anything 2000 or above is turbulent. And uh, here's a cool visualization of a sphere right here. And you can have some turbulent eddies right here. And then the currents, right? You can have them in like uh, air or in water, or you can have like, like a different uh, turbulent fluid. Flows, right? Like in a jet engine, you can have a turbulent fluid, flow, for example. Let's discuss angular momentum. A angular momentum is, is the rotational analog of linear momentum. And um, so for example, a planet has angular momentum, right? 
Think about the Earth. The Earth is rotating around the sun, right? It's going around the sun in orbit. That's its orbital angular momentum right there. And it's revolving in place as well, right? You learn this in like the uh, elementary school, right? So that's that spin, angular momentum right there. And the fact that the planet rotates and revolves is elementary idea. Then you have the different types of angular momentum there, right? So um, your orbital angular momentum is just R cross M, it's R cross P, which is uh, R cross, uh, this is uh, R cross, radius cross momentum, right? It's your cross product using your pre-calculus ideas, right? So you have your R cross MV, and then you want to, uh, and then you have the, the spin term, right? So you have this moment of inertia times angular velocity term, which is your spin angular momentum that you see over here, right? Is this term. So next you can see how we do like a vector addition of these terms when you're thinking about the planet, right? You have your orbital spin angular momentum. You can see the vectors of momentum, linear momentum vector, and like a radial vector, and other quantities here, your moment of inertia and your angular velocity vector, right? This is this is the angular velocity. But anyways, anyways. So um so this is this is the sorry, this is this is the angular momentum vector over here, and this is your angular velocity vector. All right, let's continue. So um total angular momentum is orbital angular momentum plus spin angular momentum. You can have a vector addition right here. Here's orbital, here's spin. And then here we add them to the total angular momentum using vector addition principles. All right, from here we'll end out. Hope you guys learned something. Hope you guys enjoyed this. And uh, we'll see you next week. If you have any questions, um, you can uh, use Discord or you can email uh, bchsphysics at gmail.com or you can even email me, rohan.suchdeva at warriorlife.net. And yeah, I look forward to discussing these principles with you. Uh, thank you so much for listening, everyone, and have a nice day. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.